Good morning. Welcome to our Foul First Thursday for November, and that's Foul Friends of the Waccamaw Library, uh, President Diane Stern and her staff of uh, wonderful, devoted volunteers, uh, and all the members of our friends group who really keep us going. They're, they're the fuel uh, behind uh, the Waccamaw Library uh, that, that uh, get our, our programs going, uh, make sure we have enough books on the shelves, and really make our, our library such a wonderful, uh, open, and, and welcoming place um, and support our, our children's programs, our teen programs, and our adult programs. So thank you for that. And uh, thanks to Jill Santa Petro. Uh, for getting this first Thursday program rolling, and uh, I'm trying to continue that momentum. And we have a great guest here today. Uh, this is Dr. Sean Bingham. He's a, a wonderful scholar, and uh, uh, he is uh, formerly of Florida, and now he is uh, removed, moved up to North Carolina, I went from Tampa, Florida, up to Wilmington, North Carolina. So on the coast there, and seems to be going from a swing state to swing state uh, for the uh, elections, it seems. Uh, but uh, so he's always in a hot spot. I guess he'll, he'll move to Pennsylvania next, or Ohio possibly, but uh, Dr. Anywhere Bingham, to get away from the, no hurricanes, that's what I want to get away yeah. from. That's yes, he keeps finding uh, good hurricane hotspots as well, it seems. But uh, Dr. Bingham is a sociologist. Uh, he is co editor of the Bohemian South, an interesting title The Bohemian South Creating Countercultures from Poe to Punk. It came out from the University of North Carolina Press in 2017. It's all about various ways, past and present, that the American South has served as an epicenter for progress, innovation, and experimentation. From the Southern influence on 19th century New York to 1990s Athens, Georgia music scene, to the cutting edge cuisines of millennial Asheville, New York, the Bohemian South, has long challenged traditional views of the region as a stagnant cultural backwater. Dr. Bingham's other books include Thoreau and the Sociological Imagination, The Wilds of Society, The Art of Social Critique, Painting Mirrors of Social Life, and Seriously Funny, Disability and the Paradoxical Power of Humor. Dr. Bingham is director and honors scholar, uh, sorry, honors college um, associate dean at the University of North Carolina at Wilmington, just up the road from us. For sure. Okay. Sorry, was that me or you that, that fell out? Oh, I, I believe it was you. I may have been babbling okay. Okay. senselessly just to myself sorry. here, but Sean, I, okay. I gave you. I believe a rousing introduction, but it could have just <laughs> been me, you know, okay. babbling, it, as I often do, simply to myself. Uh, but um, so you got a, a good, I think, a good introduction and uh, talking about, you know, the thesis. Yeah. This book here. Yeah. So the Bohemian South. Um, what is the Bohemian South? What is yeah, what does that mean, Sean? Yeah, so you know, if you want to put the some of the visuals up, um, absolutely. The first slide's a good kind of example, and I'm going to do a little bit of reading from the book, although not a whole lot. And I thought for this part, it might be helpful to do that because um, it's a pretty, it's a definition that's um, pretty tricky and used by different people in different ways. Um, its origin was in France, and that was both a mistake and a slur uh, used to describe the Romani, who were nomads that the French called uh, Les Bohemes. Um, the French erroneously thought the Romani came from the Bohemian region of the Czech Republic. They were wrong. 
Um, so they, the French idealized the independence of the Romani life as young counterculturalists, so they embraced that label. Um, the word later evolved to describe um, penniless and carefree writers, poets, journalists, artists, actors, sculptors, and other members of that kind of group who would be regarded as the intellectual proletariat. So these are people who lived on the margins. They valued creative expression and novelty. They experimented in all aspects of their lives, from art to what they ate to, you know, who they spent the night with. Um, they were drawn to city life, which allowed them a really eclectic, diverse experience, access to diverse uh, people. And they really lived for the moment, which oftentimes meant geographic mobility or um, in, in search of the unfamiliar. Um, they were reacting to really the opposite of that. So the, the um, really the, the bourgeoisie, uh, which we'll talk about in a little while, uh, industrialists, capitalists, um, and really define themselves in reaction to that. So, um, you know, if you look at the picture, the, the uh, picture on the left is a now, uh, unfortunately, out of business coffee shop um, that was in Nashville, North Carolina on Broadway near the Battery Park um, Book Exchange. And um, if you look in the right hand corner of that photograph, uh, there's a gentleman with a beard who would every time I walked by that coffee shop would be wearing a beret and reading something really interesting with his legs crossed and, and just really sort of. Uh, depicts the idea, I think in some ways kind of inspired the title to some extent. Um, so, you know, if we think about the South as a, at least the tropes of the South as, as steeped in tradition and provincialism and sort of cast iron values, um, those of us who worked in the book, including Dan, became really interested in kind of the, what happens when these worlds meet these more traditional worlds with these more bohemian worlds. Those of us who grew up around the South, at least, um, I think we're really interested in, in the blending of those worlds. Um, it does some really just my own fascinating interest in this is um, the cultural work that Bohemia does in the South. And we'll talk about that. In detail. Um, I happen to think Bohemia is um, maybe does a, a lot more cultural work in the South than it does in a place like New York, Seattle, and, and, and we'll get into that discussion. Um, but, you know, I guess the part of the answer is um, not, not only what is it, what is Bohemia, but um, it really gives us a novel lens, I think, for reconsidering the South. It's not a, a traditional cultural backwater the way people like H.L. Mencken have described it. Um, so we were really interested in using it as a lens to re-examine the South, and, and, and Bohemia becomes a really interesting lens for doing that. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop there for for now. Yeah, that's uh, that. You said a lot. Uh, you said plenty, and and that's why one of the reasons uh, I found this, and many others found this uh, project so interesting. It's a collection of essays. Your book all over the place, obviously from Edgar Allan Poe uh, to punk, punk rock, but all centered in the, the South. And, you know, coffee, this coffee shop that you show here, but it's World Coffee Cafe centered in Asheville, you know, which has become this kind of uh, hot spot, one of several down South of, I guess, what we'd call the Bohemian South. Uh, and such an interesting term that was a, a misnomer uh, at first, Bohemians, you know, not uh, mistaken as, uh, you know, as Czechs in France. And then it sort of drifted all over Europe. And now it's, uh, you know, it's it's come here, this, this sort of uh, subversive, uh, anti-bourgeois lifestyle. Um, but uh, it's, you know, it's it's there's something local about it. But also global, and that's that's an interesting uh, movement down south uh, too. That's that's cropped up. That seems to be mixed up in this. Yeah, I I think that's right, and I think that's why you know chapters such as yours really speak to that in detail. Um, I, having lived in the D.C. area for a while, was interested in the ways and parts of the South 
particularly the Bohemian South, were really celebrated and other parts were rejected. Um, and so, you know, we'll look at some examples, of, you know, over the next 45 minutes about the ways that um, Bohemia is localized. I mean, there, there are groups that we'll explore in a, you know, a little while. There's a chapter in here about um, train hopping, old time music playing punk rockers, right? And, yeah. and some of them that are interviewed in the book are not from the South, but they are drawn to Appalachian history and culture and music. Um, they're drawn to the spirit of the Appalachian people. Um, so there really is a, a fascinating mix of the global and the local. And, and, you know, Dan, your own chapter, which I hope you'll speak of, is, is a yeah. really fantastic example of that. Yeah. Well, um, we, I mean, we, we did just, uh, we're, I guess, still having an election right now, a presidential election at least. And I heard uh, something about that. On the yeah. News, I, I don't know if you've, uh, if you've been keeping up at all, but, uh, yeah, there's so, and you know, the, uh, the South, uh, is still pretty, it's pretty red, uh, red states conservative politically, you know, on the, on the whole. Um, so how would you, you know, if you look at that, you would say, well, this is, they, you know, it seems very conservative politically. Um, yeah. how, how would that fit into maybe, I know this is taking it in a different direction, uh, before we get into some specific examples, but how does that fit into your idea that there is this Bohemian South, though, still in existence? Yeah. Um, so that's a, in this political climate, a fantastic question. Um, if you look at cities like Austin and Asheville, um, and certainly Nashville is another emerging example, um, I, I spent a lot of time in the Asheville area. Uh, living in Wilmington, and you, what you have there, as many of many of the viewers might know, is uh, a lot of people who are between the ages of 45 and 70 moving there. Uh, many of whom are retiring; they're moving from up north. They're drawn to the outdoors and the bohemian aspects of Asheville. It's a huge draw, um, and so that kind of immigration into North Carolina, for example, or into Texas in the case of Austin, um, is reshaping certainly regions of those states. Um, mm -hmm. If you look at the maps, you know, Asheville, that area went heavily blue. The Austin area, of course, heavily blue. Um, and then, and this is something I was going to speak to a little bit later on, but what's happening in Asheville and Austin as people are attracted to these, and, th and this is nothing new, the same things happen in France and New York and San Francisco, Chicago. Um, people are attracted to these sort of bohemian areas, and you know the story. Um, all of a sudden, you know, mainstream folks are attracted to it too because it's something novel and looks authentic. And so they, they move in, uh, prices go up, and the people who originally were living there are pushed out, and so the Asheville area they're having a pricing issue in terms of housing, and that's pushing those people in a concentric circle outside the Asheville area um, in the same way. This is the same thing's happening in Austin, um, so that what starts as a small hub starts to, um, and I use this word neutrally, creep out beyond the city limits to other areas um, so that you know small businesses that were in Asheville um, run by Bohemian folks you know, they can't make a go of it because of rent prices. And all of a sudden they're moving to Henderson, Carolina, for example. Um, yeah. So, you know, as those immigration patterns keep going, North Carolina is seeing it now. I mean, we're, I, I think if you're watching the news, there was maybe a one and a half, 1.4 percent difference in the voting for the president. Um, and so politically, as, as these immigration patterns draw people here, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a political scientist, obviously, but. Um, that's at least part of the shift, I think. Yeah, it's a very interesting. Uh, very interesting. Those pockets seem to the the blue pockets do seem to be growing, uh, and that that does seem to be down south in the red states and uh, um, and so in cer certain red states around those those bohemian areas. Um, 
So can you give us some of, uh, some telling examples uh, of the Bohemian South from the book? Some, some of those uh, chapters that, sure. that uh, folks yeah. worked on. Um, absolutely. So, you know, I was, I'm very humbled to work with the group of people I work with there. They are fantastic chapters all over the book. Um, there's a tremendous, well, Daniel's chapter, uh, dance chapter is something that I knew very little about. And I, again, I'm, I'm going to, I won't do it justice by describing it, but I hope in a little while you'll speak to it. Um, there's a fantastic chapter by Grace Elizabeth Hale. Um, of University of Virginia on Athens and the music scene there from the uh, late 70s, early 90s, um, which was a cutting edge music scene that influenced independent music around the nation, college radio. Um, there's the, a chapter on these folks that I mentioned, these old time uh, train hopping punk rockers, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, it's folks that are interested in mobility, music from the past. Uh, transcending social conformity, and as as we mentioned a little while ago, a really unique uh, merging of identities that sees a lot of value in local Appalachian culture. Um, I'm really interested in, as a cultural sociologist, the merging of um, Bohemia and how it gets turned into a product. So we had some fantastic chapters on um, on Austin and its emerging changes that are happening. Um, a really great chapter on the research triangle in North Carolina. And, you know, how do, how do smaller cities attract a creative class? What is needed and the history of the research triangle and what kinds of cultural things they had to think about to attract Bohemian professors to the area. Um, other cities right now are struggling with this very thing. And if you've read Richard Florida's creative class, you sort of understand where we're going. Um, there's a fantastic chapter on Austin and, and um, creativity and resistance, which is resistance often been a part of Bohemia versus creativity and consumption. So how are these aspects of Bohemia consumed and modified? Um, or as we like to say, you know, how does counterculture get sold at the counter? Um, just sort of a crude way to put it, but it's true. There's some fantastic chapters on uh, food poetry and sexuality that'll make you blush. Um, there's some really great stuff, which we'll talk about in a little while, and the influence of Southern Bohemia uh, in New York th through the figures of Edgar Allan Poe and um, Ada Clare. Um, some great stuff on film and music and even a really great um, personal essay on a, on a Southern um, exile returning home and his experience of the South, um, you know, coming back as a Yankee, right, living up north. Yeah. Um, and even Black Mountain, I mean, you know, if you don't know about Black Mountain's history in North Carolina, um, you know, a avant-garde liberal arts experience, experimental college, really, with thinkers and artists from all over the world, where students helped build some of the structures, um, that's depicted, I think, in, in, I think, the second or third image of the slideshow. So it might be a good, good time to pull that up. Yeah, let's, um, yeah. You know, if you've heard of Buckminster Fuller, you know, he, he spent a lot of time there. Um, so these are all chapters in, in the book and, and really it was, uh, I'm not a historian, so, um, you know, it was a fantastic experience for me to learn. There's no better way to learn about this stuff than to edit a book on it, put together a book on it. Uh, it's a very humbling experience. It's, uh, that was, I mean, that's a pretty amazing, uh, run through off the top of your head there, Sean. I know. Uh, there's just so much in there. Um, there uh, so many chapters, and they're it's so diverse. So it shows you how diverse you think the uh, the Bohemian South uh, really is. And going back into the past, but bringing it up right to the present. Um, and I think you know, just to look at this uh, images of Black Mountain, North Carolina, beautiful. Uh, rural space here, a little bit outside of uh, Asheville, Hendersonville, North Carolina, uh, gorgeous place. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about the, you know, the history of this? What, what was Black Mountain College all about? Yeah, so um, I, I will not do it justice uh, as, as its author did, but 
really an experimental avant-garde um, invitation, I think, to global artists and thinkers um, who came there. And in many ways, some which were productive and some not so much, um, at some points try to put themselves on equal footing with students. And you can imagine what kind of yeah. disasters and shenanigans come out of that. Um, uh, but really, you know, at a, at a um, time when this just wasn't done in the, in the U S was a really the most avant-garde educational experience around. And, and I, I, you know, I'm no expert on black mountain college. Um, but I, I think it's, influence the Asheville area a lot because mm -hmm. some of those folks, both students and other people stuck around and really fostered and nourished um, the kind of environment that you have there. So, you know, while it's not solely responsible for the environment, I think it's seeded it in many ways. And um, this is sort of jumping ahead to something we were going to talk about a little bit later on, but um, the college now is a foundation as a nonprofit that, um, promotes a lot of really fascinating uh, discussions and art. Um, and so you're able to visit their space in downtown Asheville. I was there with students a couple of years ago and we do a talk about mid-century modern uh, architecture and furniture, which was very similar to the discussion we're having now because um, a debate emerged over how mid-century modern furniture was sort of at the time, a little bit like Ikea, it was mass produced and meant for the middle class. And the people speaking got sort of held to task by some students because they make a lot of money selling high-end mid-century modern furniture that's, you know, plastic and made out of molded plastic. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, Black Mountain College still having an influence. And by the way, people who left that school when it shut down went to a range of other colleges, uh, including my home state, New College of Florida. Um, so that, that school continues to have an influence. Yeah, it was it really uh, a it was a wild place. I think we could say, yeah. in in yeah. all senses of the world, were yes, and yeah. really, uh, you know, it was wide open and had some, you know, some absolutely influential artists, uh, avant garde, and uh, the poets too. The Black Mountain School it was yep. highly influential, and and the there were folks like Robert Duncan and. Um, and Jonathan Williams, who was a uh, a Southern poet, one of the few who really was one of those uh, experimental poets associated with the South, uh, but they had uh, immense influence going forward too, as as you were saying, and uh, the students coming out of there. But it also there wasn't really any uh, infrastructure, so things got a little crazy too there, and it you know financially things kind of. Well, it went downhill quick, so that's yeah. maybe the downside of the bohemian uh, ness. But uh, but it it had a it had a very interesting run. So, um, yeah, yeah, I I think you know there's a lot to be learned uh, for academics on both sides of the yes. the pluses and minuses of a place like Black Mountain College. Yeah, sure. so. Really interesting, a place, uh, you know, a place to, to visit uh, if you're heading up that way. The vestiges of that, as you say, it's there's still, uh, there, the traces are still there. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, you know, we're, we're big fans of uh, Edgar Allan Poe at the library. We had a, a, a we celebrated his, uh, his birth date. Um, a uh, couple of years ago with a, a big, uh, an actor, a local actor, uh, Vince Triana came and, and did a performance, a great performance uh, in the guise of Poe uh, for us at the library. But uh, um, what about, you know, Edgar Allan Poe? There's a chapter on, on Poe and a, uh, as a Southerner and a Southern, bo a sort of proto-Bohemian, uh, he's mentioned in the book. Yeah. So, and this is another part where I think I'm going to okay. give you a little bit straight out of the book about both Poe and Claire. And, yeah, oops. Uh, if, that's if that's all right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so even before the Civil War, and I'm reading straight from the introduction here, Proto-Bohemians Edgar Allan Poe and Ada Claire had already left the South for parts north. 
Their influence on the northern scene of Bohemia had clear links to their southern identities and their desire to escape the constrictive bourgeois values of their Dixie past. If Bohemia offered a refuge from a struggle to belong in a world of traditional social hierarchies, Poe and Claire charted the course for the future wanderlust of American Bohemia. Poe's bohemianism was a clear reaction to the South he knew. Um, as the original historian of the American bohemian scene, Albert Perry, describes, um, Poe was adopted by the Allens. When they adopted him, the memory of his outcast and ancestry um, was persistently brought back. And what he wanted to do was escape from the painful reality of his uncertain social position. Um, it's much more complicated, though, than simply a reaction against the South. He has been credited as a forefather of Southern Gothic literature and Southern resistance. He wrote for and edited the Southern Literary Messenger. And as Edward Whitley, who's one here, uh, describes in his chapter, Poe's style of writing influenced the New York bohemian literature scene. I'm going to throw in Ada Clare here, if that's okay, too. Absolutely. Um, who was considered the queen of Bohemia. She ditched her er uh, aristocratic <laughs> roots in Charleston yeah. for Paris and later New York, where she became a central figure of the scene at Pfaff's Bar in Greenwich Village. Um, again, as Edward Whitley reveals in his chapter, um, the tapestry of American bohemianism is woven through the many threads emerging and finishing in the South. Um, a great number of bohemians of any bell in New York interpreted their own bohemianism through the examples of Poe's Southern outsider Poe's and Claire's distinctive Southern charm peppered with radical feminism and artistic knowledge. Um, yeah, in his chapter, Edward describes Claire's disposition as a unique amalgamation of Southern hostess and Bohemian queen <laughs> whose freedom of travel and experiment was funded by plantation spoils. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, both those, uh, who, uh, you know, grew up in Richmond, Virginia, and had this sort yep. of uh, uh, his his was uh, semi adopted, I guess we would say, was raised by the this wealthy um, family, the the Allens, who wanted to be uh, they had uh, cl wanted claim to be, uh, I guess, Southern aristocracy, even though they were it, John Allen was Scottish and. But they, they wanted to sort of put on the airs of Southern aristocracy, and they get this adopted uh, kid who's, you know, this guy who we're looking at, you know, who was not, he was precocious, he was dark, he was, you know, he was just this uh, kind of a mess and had, you know, did not uh, fit the mold that they wanted him to fit. Um, he was bohemian, and, you know, he was subversive, counter- um, and just kept getting thrown out of, uh, uh, out of, uh, UVA, out of uh, West yep. Point, he, you know, yep. gambling, drinking. Um, so he, he didn't, he didn't, uh, fit what they wanted him to be. Uh, and he kind of spread that everywhere he went and became this sort of, you know, dark, uh, subversive Gothic, uh, figure. Um, so that was... You know, he he became one of the early figures of this uh, Bohemian South. Uh, that's the argument, uh, and a really compelling one that would inspire others. And then Ada Clare is, you know, the the queen of Bohemian that where it mixes with uh, this Southern. She's a hostess, you know, Southern hospitality yeah. up in yeah. uh, Greenwich Village. She she helped really. Uh, sort of start that or uh, as a uh, as a bohemian enclave up in New York. So it's, that's interesting how in both cases, the uh, a, a Southern bohemian uh, kind of ethos gets exported elsewhere. Yeah. And even, you know, um, one of the things I didn't know about Ada Claire was, and, and not unlike, you know, some, but not all, the Bohemian folks that we might know is, you know, um, they're being funded by someone yeah. else. And then Ada's clear, Ada Claire's, you know, from this aristocratic family, yeah. made money off of, allegedly off a of plantation. Um, you know, that complicates things, and it, and it complicates things in ways that are involved, but that relate to, you know, Bohemianism, 
um, money commodification. Yeah. And it's the point is made in the chapter that, uh, you know, she was a, a feminist figure, subversive in that way, and yet, um, you know, may have profited uh, that hospitality that she was, Southern hospitality that she was sort of uh, bringing up north, that was based on, you know, a very uh, dark system of, of chattel slavery yeah. uh, that it enabled her to be hospitable. Um, but the figures who she was um, interacting with at uh, up in Greenwich Village were folks like Walt Whitman and uh, yeah. Winslow Homer, who would actually go and serve in in the uh, Civil War uh, for the Union side. So it, all kinds of uh, complexities going on. Absolutely. And uh, and then. Maybe uh, if you could say a word about uh, mess this up. Um, about uh, how about the this these images here? Uh, we we recognize them. I think uh, Garden and Gun and Oxford uh, American the glossy uh, images here. So what what about uh, how did this these images figure into the uh, the idea of the Bohemian South? Yeah, so um, several chapters in the book examine the ways in which the Bohemian South is used both to attract people, you know, to, to live in places like the Research Triangle um, or businesses um, or in, in, you know, to sell Bohemian Southern identity outside of the South or inside the South. Um, so my chapter, as an example, um, looks at these two different magazines and, and two really different ways, uh, in some ways similar, but in some ways different of examining the South. Um, you know, magazines, there's a lot to be said right now about the death of magazines, but these magazines are yeah. surviving and, and selling widely outside of the South. Um, so the, I found the magazine as a great venue for this kind of hybrid world of Bohemian bourgeois together, um, which I think, you know, one of these magazines done does more than the other, but magazines are centered around consumption in, in many ways. So um, they also, and I'll, I'll speak to both of them just quickly, but they blur, they, they become an interesting kind of experimentation for identities um, and also a way to kind of help the, help folks outside the South develop a new identity of the South. I mean, the garden, th this, yes. the G and G magazine sells widely outside the South. Yeah. Um, so I was looking at, you know, what kind of Bohemian South stories are told in these magazines and, and who's their audience. So, uh, you know, G and G, for example, their median income of their reader subscriber is about $171,000 and they have a net worth of $1.5 million. So this is a really different audience. Um, so if you look at the magazine and the way it tells stories about the South, the South can be consumed. It can be, and there's actually sections, drink, eat, sleep, shop, a lot of ads about private resorts and, um, you know, on one hand, serious writers like John T. Edge, um, who, who are doing interesting work on social class and race, um, topics like Wendell Berry, Shelby Adams, creatives in the South, creative artisans, who would who would tell you that you know the magazine helps expose them. Um, so on one hand, it's a really interesting entree into Bohemian worlds in the South. It's kind of a testing ground of identity. On the other hand, um, you know there are times where you might be closing a page of the magazine and on one side you have, you know, John Lewis, the civil rights activist, and then an advertisement for Land Rover, yeah. which is sort of a jarring thing um, to see. Uh, the other thing about that magazine, which I, I read, but I find interesting is, you know, about 50% of it is advertising. Mm -hmm. um, whereas you look at the Oxford American and it's a really different kind of beast. It also has a heavy list of contributors, um, that people that write for the Atlantic and New York and Harper's. Um, it's mission, and it is a nonprofit that's been run out of various universities. Um, but like many bohemian organizations, it sort of start and stopped and was saved at one time by John Grisham. 
but some really hard-hitting writing on social issues and race, education, longer-form journalism uh, than G&G. Um, so they'll get into complexities of, you know, um, black artist involvement in minstrel music, for example. Um, they take a very different kind of critical view on guns uh, versus the other magazine. Um, so, you know, I was interested in both of them and what kind of story about the Bohemian South is is told. Um, and, you know, how, how to, as, as an outsider outside the South, if you're reading these two magazines, you know, what, what kind of picture comes out. Um, what you see in both of them is that bohemianism becomes a way to sort of sell a place, um, but more importantly, a place to merge identities, which is really what we were interested in with the book. So using bohemia as a, as a way to look at how multiple identities converge and collide. Yeah, it, it's a brilliant chapter. And, and those, I, I think, uh, it, it, it is well worth uh, looking into, and uh, it is, you know, those two magazines uh, really have been sort of, they've been rivals, and um, they are, they really are uh, ways to pinpoint uh, at least a couple of major images of the South that are competing in the media today. So um, I think it's, and even looking at the covers we have up right now, it's, yeah. you know, the Oxford America wants to draw you in to the, you know, to the reading. It's less involved. And uh, Garden and Gun wants you, you know, it's more, it is about the, uh, think more about the, the image itself, perhaps, the, the glossiness. Uh, but you do have, you have Wendell Berry. That's an interesting figure, the rural genius of Wendell Berry in terms yeah. of, you know, the whole bohemian scene, uh, the back to, to the earth and organic farming and ecological movement. And so, which is perhaps another, another angle to the bohemian South as well. Yeah. And, you know, the, I don't want to dwell on this too much because I do want to, folks to hear about your chapter but um you know these these magazines again i read both of them um i'm, I'm intrigued by both of them yeah they they share some of the same writers and they okay. both i think serve an important function which is to keep art keep writers writing about the south and instead of exporting themselves like some of our best southern writers have exported themselves um so they just do it in really different styles and yeah. and uh, as somebody who teaches a course on consumer culture, I'm really interested in the methods that they use. And I know, you know, to be honest, Garden and Gun, you know, pays the bills. That's been the right. You know, they, yeah. And that is, you know, throughout uh, publishing history, that's been, yeah. you know, they that Faulkner had to pay the bills. Uh, you know, yeah. Hemingway, Fitzgerald, they all. Uh, Willa Cather, everyone down the line, you gotta, uh, that's, that's part of it. So it is, Absolutely. and there's some wonderfully talented, uh, writers in Garden and Gun. And Absolutely. So it's, it's, it, it isn't either or, it's not a thumbs up. Right. Thumbs down. Yeah. It's, it again is very, it's a complicated story. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, and, and a, that, that image, um, uh, on the cover of Garden and Gun too, you know, we, we touched on it, but that uh, Southern music in its various forms uh, um, is, that's the lead singer uh, formerly of the Carolina Chocolate Drops, but yeah. roots music, blues music, uh, their chapters on, uh, you mentioned the, the Athens scene with R.E.M. Yeah. and B-52s, all of that. Uh, there's so much music flowing through um, uh the Bohemian South, that that's Southern music is um, jazz. Uh, uh, is, what, why is music so important uh, to, to the Bohemian South? Is there, is that too big a question? But it's, it's throughout uh, this volume, but. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty big question, but it, you know, this, it gets to, and I'm not going to answer it, but it gets to my, 
struggle that I had when I was living up in the DC Baltimore area where, you know, um, they had at one point in time, they moved this all online, but for 30 plus years, the Washington DC NPR station Monday through Friday from three to six o'clock prime driving home news time had a bluegrass show. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was into early 2000s before they moved it all online and had NPR news. Um, bluegrass was hot around D.C. for many years. And so there, there, I think in, in many cities outside of the South, there's always been this draw and celebration to various kinds of Southern music. We want this piece of the South, but we don't want this piece of the South. And sometimes that's fair. And other times it's a little unfair. Um, so I, I was intrigued by this thing of, you know, music in particular, because I'm, that's sort of my, the art form that I'm drawn the most to. Um, I, I became really intrigued by the, the sort of pick and choose of folks outside the South of what aspects they're going to celebrate and, and not just celebrate, but really, um, lean into take on as their own. I don't want to say co-opt, but borrow from, um, but then sort of turn their nose up at other pieces of, of the South. You know, music travels well for sure. Um, and it's something that if you're a writer, it's hard, you know, if you're not getting your stuff published, it's hard to get it out there. Whereas if you're a street busker as a musician, you know, you can offer to play for free in a, in a club or on the side of the road. And so you can, you can gain some exposure. It's a little bit harder with some of the other art forms, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's something you mentioned the folks, uh, the the train hoppers, yeah. you know, can just hop on a train and go uh, with their instrument and um, they can travel around for free and play for free and spread music around that way. Um, so there, there's yeah. a chapter. Yeah. That was the really one of the most fascinating chapters of the book, I think, just because... Um, it's a group of folks that, you know, I think many readers would be surprised that this group still exists. Um, and it, it was a very refreshing kind of read. You know, you think about people who are really living the bohemian lifestyle um, that some of us, you know, who have a mortgage and other things at times wish we could live. Um really fascinating that authentic subcultures like this not only still exist, but, you know, can thrive in, in parts of the South. Um, and that's where just quickly, I mean, I get back to the, the thing about, you know, that bohemianism I think is, is personally almost more important here because it's easy to be bohemian in San Francisco as long as you can afford the rent or New York city, because you've got a circle of people, you know, that'll support that. Um, easy in, in parts of the South. Um, and, and, you know, it's, I think there are pockets certainly that we could talk about, but, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a different, it's a different experience, um, and a different set of, um, uh, you know, you, you stick out in a place like Lakeland, Florida, um, or Tifton, Georgia, if you, if you look bohemian, um, you don't necessarily stick out in parts of New York or Seattle uh, right. or San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah, that, that out of placeness. Um, so, and <clears throat> yeah, so it's it, in some ways it's more, it works differently uh, down south than other areas. Um, and do you think that's, is that, if a result of the South being um, more rural, is it is it urbanization question, or is that is that more the larger uh, cultural history of the South? That's a great question. Um, probably the second one. I think I think the 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 culture. Um, 
And, you know, rural plays a piece because if you've got an urban, I mean, you look at the port cities in in the south um, or the bigger cities, um, there's much more of a sense of novelty and change. And, you know, think about a place like New Orleans, which is long had a bohemian scene of people coming in and out. You're just exposed to more people. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, if you if you are living in a small rural area where perhaps generations of your family grow up there and stay there and don't move, um, your experience of novelty and change is very different. Uh, so city life certainly played a, a role. In but I, I do think, you know, I don't I don't say this as a as a trope about the South, but tradition works very differently in the South um, than and and in some ways that's good, and in some ways there are some really horrific sides of that. Um, you know, I think I think the folks who have stayed in the South, Southern writers, for example, could speak way more eloquently than I could about, you know, why do they stay here? What is it? What is it about the South um, and its very best sides of its face uh, that keep us here? Um, oh, my doorbell's ringing. Sorry. <laughs> that's that it was going to happen and uh you know i have uh i mentioned before we started i have uh three dogs who i'm just assuming they've all escaped uh through the hole in the back fence because <laughs> i they somehow have not interrupted us with barking uh so yeah. far so they must have At least, they must have fled better, better than my kids barking i guess yeah, well that too uh, yeah, that too, because, uh, yeah, mine of mine are actually in school today for, for a change, so one of their yeah. own days, otherwise they would be barking. Um, so yeah, well, that's a great, um, uh, that's a great, uh, a point in the port cities too, in New Orleans and, uh, um, which connects and, you know, that, that Southern relationship with artists and writers of uh, William Faulkner, the famous ending of Absalom, Absalom, his character, Quentin Compson, I don't hate the South, I don't hate the South, I don't, I don't, that kind of doubleness, you know, yeah. you stay here, uh, there are things you don't love about it necessarily, but you don't hate it, you don't hate it. Uh, it's sort of a countercultural, you know, Focus there, and and Faulkner, of course, spent time in New Orleans, that, yep. that port city, that uh, very bohemian southern city, and um, and my my chapter, I guess, uh, it focused on the poet Brenda Marie Osby, one of the figures who was she's uh, New Orleans uh, poet very much, and uh, and uh, and Kwame Dawes, who was uh, wonderful poet who was born in Ghana, moved through, grew up in Jamaica, influenced by Bob Marley, and uh, came to South Carolina, spent much of his life, most of his life in South Carolina, and now is in Nebraska. So he's been you know, moving all around, um, but uh, I think still count him as a Southern poet, uh, because, but he has that kind of, uh, I think, that open-ended sort of port sensibility, port city uh, sensibility, uh, and connects with Bob Marley very much. Uh, you know, he's written about Bob Marley uh, in his work, and so I, I consider Bob Marley as well a, a Southern Bohemian uh, poet. So, um, but th that openness to to fluidity and, and newness and novelty. Uh, I think there is something that you get uh, in in those port areas. There are a little more, you know, you, people coming in, coming out. There's there is that fluidity. Yeah, and you know, I think whether I would certainly think say that the books that you wrote about, and if you haven't, if you get your hands on this book, uh, folks who are watching or will watch, you know, please read Dan's chapter. Um, you know, all of these folks that we're talking about, whether they're musicians or writers, um, poets, they're interested in other people's stories who are different from them. 
you know, what's your story is a common sort of driving question. Um, and so I, I think that as, as somebody who sees at, at times, you know, the, the, the darker side of the South, and this could be anywhere, but, or this, this certainly what I'm about to say could be anywhere, the homogenous side that everyone has to wear, you know, fill in the blank with what the brand is, um, vineyard vines and owns a Yeti mug, you know, I, that's fine. Uh, I, I'm interested in a range of stories, not just those stories. Um, so, I, you know, that's, what's most fascinating. I think about folks like the ones that you wrote about is, is, um, they're really interested in, in all kinds of voices, um, which, you know, to go back to the stuff about the election, I mean, I, I, I this has been stated multiple times, but empathy and interest in others and their stories, I think, could go along with making us a more civil country politically. Um, but it, I, I and, and that's what I think bohemian folks in the South bring to the table. How would you connect this uh, book, The Bohemian South, to you wrote a book about uh, Henry David Thoreau and kind of what of Maybe we could say America's first environmentalist uh, philosopher, but if not first, one of the most important. Um, yeah. And yeah, how, I mean, you wrote a book about uh, Thoreau. You also uh, published a book about uh, stand up comedy uh, that I mentioned uh, in the intro um, and the power of humor, seriously funny. Uh, you know, humor as a kind of social critique, but um, how would you relate this book to those books? Is there, a, yeah. are there any common threads? So on the surface, it looks like I just have uh, massive attention deficit issues because I'm all over the board, which is not untrue. <laughs> um, but I think what I'm most fascinated with is, um, Things that seemingly don't fit together. So with Thoreau, I was looking at him from a sociological perspective. He's known, you know, for um, being an environmentalist. Um, he was a scientist. He was running in early circles of, of scientists and sending scientific work to Harvard. He kept some of the most detailed weather logs, for example. Um, he was a poet. He was a philosopher. Uh, so... I, I was interested in kind of bringing him into the social sciences and sociology and saying, you know, why, why don't we look at people like this? Um, so kind of pulling somebody in to my discipline that seemingly didn't fit. Um, I worked on an edited book about political art, which is similar to this book in a way that it's all over the board, architecture, um, novelists, um, cartoonists. And so that's another one where, you know, People um, like art critic Terry Teachout believe that art and politics should not mix unless it's religious art. He gives that a pass. Um, so we looked at what happens, you know, when these things come up against each other. And what is it about the artistic perspective that actually is has a, the artistic lens functions as a form of political and social critique? Not that somebody's just politics into something, but the actual lens itself of looking from the outside becomes an interesting political tool. Same thing with the comedy book. You know, we're told not to laugh at people with disabilities. These comedians have disabilities. Um, and so what it was it about humor and the punchline of a joke and the way of looking at something from a humorous perspective that actually becomes the form of critique. Uh, so again, it's not like they're reading just criticism into their joke, but the, the actual punchline of the joke and the way of seeing this as something humorous um, becomes sort of what captures the conscience of the king, for example. Um, mm. So I'm interested in things that don't seemingly don't go together, Bohemia and the South, for example. Yeah. Um, the next project that I'm working on is on the tiny housing movement and, and the ways in which um, deep stories about the American dream are tied to housing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what can be explored um, in terms of happiness and um, local politics from looking at 
tiny housing through the lens of that. Just as one quick example, I'm going to throw out one quick anecdote. Um, one of the guys that we interviewed for the book uh, is is um, is a guy named Ryan, who's a who's a really a leader in the tiny housing movement and one of the first people to publish information on how to do this on your own. Uh, so he's in Charlotte building a tiny house, and uh, this curious older woman walks by and starts asking him questions. What are you doing there? Talks to him for 20 or 30 minutes and then says, uh, looks at him and says, let me ask you a question. Who would want to marry you if this is what you aspire to? And so, you know, wrapped up in that is all kinds of things about um, the American dream, about marriage, about aspirations, um, happiness. Uh, so, you know, interested in things that are sort of merging together that seemingly, you know, folks think maybe shouldn't go together. Yeah, that that's a, that's a fascinating topic. I mean, another, you know, again, you, you do seem like you're all over the place, but they, there is I, that thread, I, and that is, uh, you know, it's, it's a fascinating topic, the tiny house movement, um, and especially as you know, housing becomes so tight uh, in many areas, and it's, you know, it's such a crux of how we identify ourselves, and... Um, it's, uh, you know, that one of my favorite movies is It's a Wonderful Life. Um, you know, that's December 1946. And the whole thing, the vision of Americanness, well, not the whole thing, but so much of it is based on housing and the housing market. You know, in 1946, that's the, you know, post-war war America. And it's so bound up in you've got to have the house house is yeah. the basis of the family and you know you everybody's giving loans to one another to secure that big house and you know everybody's uh and if you don't uh you know potter's going to come in and and get your house and uh otherwise you're living in potter's field and you know it's just all bound up in that house if you take that away you know then well who's going to want to marry you and and you know yeah, uh, it, it it changes the entire equation of American, the basis of Americanness and identity. But maybe, you know, maybe that's what needs to, maybe there needs some shake up here. What happens if we do yeah. that? You don't have. Yeah, to I mean, the, one of the, yeah, yeah, that's sort of coming out of the housing crisis. This is. Part of why the tiny housing movement has exploded as much as it has, um, and I say that sort of size metaphorically, um, is, you know, folks like Ryan, the guy I was mentioning, lost his job in corporate America. Um, you know, white collar worker with, I, th I think, a graduate degree and um, asked himself, you know, do I want to do I want to work 14 hours a day for a company and then be left like this? Or do I want to lower my expenses? Um, maybe for 10 years, save enough money so I can pay cash for a small house. So the tiny housing becomes a tool. Um, if you look at, you know, all kinds of studies on how people move through their homes, you know, the homes have gotten twice as big as they were in the fifties and sixties, and they have half the number of people in them. And we're, there are tons of rooms and homes that all kinds of motion studies that people don't go into for a week at a time, but they're spending time at a job to pay for that room. And so part of the, exploration of this becomes how do we want to spend our time do we want to spend our yes. time working to pay for a house uh or doing other things with people having other experiences outside of work yes and uh you know there are definitely the parts of my my house i you know that the boys and dogs have uh have corrupted beyond repair that uh, I hope never to go into again. So, yeah, but uh, yeah, that's fascinating. Hey, Sean, we have a question. Question has appeared for you. Uh, okay. Holly, Holly Temple has asked, where are the Bohemian pockets you referenced in your talk? So where, where would these be? 
um, so I can give you some. There, there are um, certainly many that I don't know about. Um, you know, I think Asheville, some of the cities that we've talked about, Asheville is one. Um, you know, on a smaller level, there are Black Mountain area, certainly. Um, the beginning of the book references Savannah in some ways because of the location of, of SCAD, the Savannah College of Art and Design, which has its own complex sort of um, bohemian, bourgeois, because that's a super expensive school, and a lot of those students are going to go work in the culture industry making advertising. Um, some will make more traditional art. Um, I would put Oxford, Mississippi in there. I would put Athens in there. Um, pockets of Sarasota, Florida, I would put in there. I spent a lot of time down there, too. Um, you may notice, and this isn't, I'm not saying this is um, a requirement, but what you'll notice, I think, with a lot of these places is um, a university or college in the area, which, which I think more often than not really nurtures a bohemian scene. Um, you know, SCAD, for example, if you've been to Savannah, you're going to see the SCAD students all over carrying their art stuff and their art galleries all over the place. And you'll see those students doing art outside. Um, I think in Asheville, while it's not the only influence, the influence of Black Mountain College and UNC Asheville and Warren Wilson nice. all play a role there. Um, Oxford, Mississippi, you know, a long history of of writers, uh, Faulkner, uh, Barry Hanna, and others. Um, and, you know, for a town that size to have the rich, independent bookstore scene that it has. Um, those are the, kind of, in my own travels, the immediate ones that come to mind. I mean, certainly there are hundreds of, if not thousands, of really smaller pockets. Um, but those are those are sort of the bigger ones on my radar screen. Athens, I haven't been to in several years, but, um, you know, if you get a chance uh, to borrow the book from the library, I mean, the, the chapter on the Athens music scene with, with R.E.M. and other bands, when you walk around Athens now, having read that chapter, it's a totally different experience. Um, and, and, you know, not to belabor this too much, but Athens is really interesting because, you know, and I don't mean to sound, to drop a kind of a pun style of acronym joke out there, but you've got REM and the influence that they had in Athens and the SEC. And that's a really weird <laughs> mixture of worlds. Um, but that's what some college towns are like. Um, I think there's some emerging scenes, certainly, and, um, that have a, like a strong Chapel Hill, uh, the Research Triangle area, too. Um, I don't spend as much time in Tennessee or Virginia anymore, but um, I know Chattanooga is changing a lot. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe maybe in conjunction with the library, we'll do a tour of Bohemian pockets around the South. That, that would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah, a, a, uh, a visual tour. We'll go on the road. With the cameras, the Boso, as I yeah, as you should start good. calling it, Boso yeah. tour. Um, yeah, I was I was thinking, uh, you know, East Nashville. There's yeah. a chapter on on the West End in the book, but that was back in the day, and then things were Bohemian. I lived in East Nashville, and that was sort of the, I would say, the Bohemian side in the '90s, early 2000s. Now it's it's kind of going maybe the way of uh, that you were describing Athens. You know, it might have it, it might be you know sort of turning over a little too much that it's gotten. I'm not sure if it would still be Bohemian or not nowadays. Maybe, may, still pockets maybe, but that I might add that to the list. Uh, yeah, at least the I one think that, it was. I think that's right. Um, you know when. I don't want to overplay this too much, but when Jack White moved his headquarters there, basically, and now you've got musicians from all over the world coming there, um, yeah. then you're, you're getting more younger 
startup companies who don't want to pay the prices of Austin who move to Nashville instead. And then, and then, you know, the cycle that ensues from there. Yeah. So it's, those are some, and, and, you know, there could be others springing up. Uh, I mean, no, yeah, in, possibly in, maybe in the Greenville, South Carolina area, possibly outside there, you know, Taylor's, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, Greenville's really, boy, they've, they've, they've done some, uh, and I'm going to use the word development because that's what it is, but I, yeah. I, I think there are some interesting things happening there, um, both both bohemian and and yes. more more bourgeois for sure. It, it's it's definitely a mix. It's definitely a mix up there, and it's not real clear which way yeah. that's going to go. But maybe some little pockets of bohemian that are going on. Okay. Well, I hope I hope that was uh, good. Good answer for Holly there. Oh, and and I believe that's that is it for the uh, questions. Okay. Um, and we do have uh, I know coming up. Um, we have, uh, we didn't miss, mention this guy's chapter, but uh, Zach Vernon, uh, who's up at Appalachian State, wrote a, a wonderful chapter on uh, Rough South uh, films. But uh, Zach is going to come visit, uh, visit us, uh, or virtually at least, um, for a symposium on Southern foodways coming up. And Excellent. which should be exciting, South Carolina foodways actually, and um, you know that's something that's in the book as well. Foodways that you know how um, that's a major aspect of the Bohemian South. Uh, how these uh, traditional Southern dishes of all sorts have really become exported. They're in the South first of all, but also exported all over. Uh, all over the the country, at least, if not internationally, as you know, they become uh, high cuisine out there in in restaurants. That's a big; those are big doings. Uh, the the southern uh, food market has foodie uh, culture has just blown up. It seems that's part of that's part of the Bohemian South. That's something that was considered. Yeah, considered backward, and uh, it was not uh, not esteemed at all for for so long. The, you know, throwaway foods have suddenly been uh, revived as as yeah. uh, the high culture dishes at fancy restaurants. Yeah, yeah. There's actually a there's a chapter in there called Trash Food, which sort of yeah, looks at you know, shame and food and um, it's absolutely, and you know, we could do a whole series on that for yeah. sure. Yeah, I was I was just putting a plug in for you know for some up upcoming uh, library programming there, but uh, Is that just a uh, plug for Zach. He's way more articulate than I am, so enjoy. Yeah, Zach is is wonderful and. Uh, um, he has he has hair and a beard, <laughs> glasses, so he looks nothing like he. Is I have a face made for radio. <laughs> um, no, you you are. Uh, we we loved having you on, Sean, and uh, really appreciate uh, everything. Uh, and it is a it's a terrific uh, book. We really. Show it up, uh, the Bohemian South, in front of my space made for radio. Um, and thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for including me in the book. But uh, it's there's so much else in there, and uh, I look forward to everything else you're doing up 
up the up there um, in Wilmington, and hopefully sometime you'll be able to come visit in person and absolutely we'll talk about you know maybe tiny houses uh, next time. I look forward to it. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Great to see you, and thanks so much for being with us. Uh, that absolutely, was, uh, thanks for having me. You know so much about uh, so many different things, so it's it's hard to pick <laughs> a topic with you. Uh, uh, my children would not agree with you on that comment. I, we should uh, we should trade off because I, uh, there's a similar thesis in this household from my my children. Common, yeah. I think. Yes, yeah. and and we'll have to uh, we'll have to uh, compare some. We made spoons together. Carb spoons that as a final note, um, yours was much more conventional uh, in traditional spoon making skills. Mine was very avant garde, bohemian was, style. Very, very Black Mountain college. Yes. Very, yeah. very much cutting edge. Uh, not a very functional spoon, but you know, right. it's artistic, I think. Um, but great to see you again, uh, Sean, and thanks so you. much for being with us. And um, we will see you again soon. Hello to the the children and family. And thank you again to thank Val, you. friends of the Waccamaw Library, and we will have uh, Marjorie Spruill up uh, next time in December talking about uh, 100 uh, years of women's suffrage and the role of women in getting the vote right here in South Carolina. So another awesome. exciting episode of Foul First Thursday coming up for us. Thank y'all and have a wonderful day. Thanks. Take care. Take care, Sean.